Great. Um, thanks to uh, Mike and Kirk. They uh, basically did a bunch of my work for me. I'm trying to explain where water comes from. I'm basically going to deal with, uh, you know, what uh, what we do with the water that we actually get and the, the quality of the water we get. So my name is Peter Monk. I'm a water resource engineer, also a uh, resident in Big Sky. The company's called Alpine Water. I'm also a uh, public water system operator. I state I operate some of the uh, water systems up here in Big Sky. So I'm going to start with the uh, Big Sky Water and Sewer District area served here. Basically, uh, uh, estimates are there's around 2,000 service connections that are provided by the uh, Water and Sewer District between the Meadow Village area, about twice as many down here as there are up in the uh, Mountain Village area, serviced by two separate sets of wells, though the system is interconnected. Um, this system provides about 250 million gallons of water per year to their customers. And as uh, Mike mentioned, generally is uh, very high quality water with low levels of contaminants due to the alluvial nature of the aquifers. Here are some, uh, is a table of the uh, uh, you know, basic kind of water quality uh, constituents, uh, you've got the meadow wells there on the left and then the mountain wells there on the right. Um, I, not included on this list are the uh, maximum contaminant levels that are uh, recommended for these uh, constituents, but they're all fairly low with the exception of the uh, calcium hardness, which you can see there highlighted in yellow. Um, so as we said, uh, um, dissolved calcium magnesium ions in the water also known as uh, lime scale, are the uh, kind of bane of the, uh, the water system here. Uh, the levels aren't exceptionally high, but they are, you know, present. It's a, it's a concern for water users both in the meadow and on the mountain. Uh, why do we care about lime scale? Uh, not really for drinking water, generally uh, mineralized water, especially with calcium magnesium, is uh, healthy to drink. Um, the aesthetics are a little more problematic. People don't like white stuff all over their fixtures and uh, shower doors and windows, and etc. Um, as we saw from the other pictures, uh, clogged pipes uh, requires more soap or detergent to clean away. Uh, fouling or failure of appliances is a big concern for people. Water heaters last uh, minus treatment uh, down here, maybe. Uh, you know, five to eight years as opposed to the uh, 12 to 15 years that they maybe should last. Uh, another concern is the uh, decrease in the efficiency with which uh, appliances function. When you foul a heat exchanger like that on the bottom, it does not do a very good job of transferring heat from the elements to the water. So typically up to a 30% decrease in the efficiency of uh, function of appliances basically meaning you're using more electricity to generate the same amount of hot water. Um, and the average household um, can generate over 150 pounds of wine scale a year, which is fairly impressive. Uh, how do we deal with lime scale? Uh, without getting too into the uh, technicalities, there's basically two kind of major schools here, the classical kind of ion exchange salt water softener. Um, uh, benefits are it removes all the hardness from the water. How it does this basically exchanges all the calcium magnesium ions for salt ions that you're putting back into the water. Uh, cons are it's more expensive, complicated to install. You know, you're continually adding salt to the system. Every milligram per liter of hardness of calcium magnesium ions that you are removing are replaced by a milligram per liter of salt ions. So uh, generally salt water is not uh, healthy to drink for uh, long terms. And then we waste a lot of water, 10,000 gallons of water per year, typically just in recharging the system. And then there's also the brine water discharge, basically the water that you're using in your house that then goes down the uh, drain and ends up in the uh, septic system. And uh, brine water, salty water is, def is uh, generally impedes the processes that are taking place in the uh, treatment systems. So then there are, uh, you know, chelation or uh, magnetic water softeners. They're cheaper, easier to install. There's no flushing or waste, no salt. Your minerals stay in the water. Basically, as that picture at the bottom shows, that's a chelated hardness molecule. You see the white uh, chelation factors on there. Basically bind the spots where uh, the hardness ions would normally want to stick to your pipes and appliances. They neutralize that effect and cause the 
hardness to just flow through the water. Um, the drawbacks is that if you have a place where water actually evaporates, that mineral water is still in there and it will break the chelation and uh, it will stay there. So your tea kettle won't be as clean as you would have hoped. Uh, why is this important to Big Sky? Uh, we do some uh, math here, 2,000 service connections. We assume maybe a quarter of the people have uh, salt water softeners. They, you know, 8,000 gallons of wastewater. We're talking about 4 million gallons of wastewater per year. And then uh, about 80,000 gallons of annual domestic usage per service connection per year equals about 40 million gallons of salt water discharge to the sewer system. Uh, we process about 120 million gallons of sewage here. So rough estimate is about 30% of the wastewater uh, that we process here has high chloride levels as a result of ion exchange water softeners. And this has also been revealed in some of the sampling that they've done on the, uh, on the streams out here. Um, you know, it tends to uh, arrive in the environment as well. So in other parts of the country, um, Communities, cities, uh, states have con uh, contemplated and actually implemented restrictions and bans on water softeners. Michigan, Connecticut, Texas, Massachusetts, Arizona, California, uh, different uh, entities there have all restricted or banned uh, uh, salt water softeners because of adverse effects of salt on the environment and the increase in cost that is associated with the treatment of salt water at the, uh, uh, at the septic level. So that's Big Sky Water and Sewer. Now let's look at the outlying areas. Uh, here's a picture of your typical uh, modest private water system in <laughs> Big Sky. Um, so the uh, blue area is kind of our general greater Big Sky area, our kind of study area for the purpose of this um, project here. Uh, the red is the Big Sky Water Sewer District boundary, and then the uh, green are some other public water systems that are operational here. At the bottom, you have the uh, Ramshorn subdivision and the Ofer School. In the middle, there's that Antler Ridge Estates, and then at the top, Yellowstone Club, and then um, Moonlight Basin. Uh, gross approximations of the, uh, the boundaries here, but uh, generally that is the idea. And basically, anyone living in that blue area outside of the red or green polygons is on their own for water. So uh, you are a private, unregulated water system. Uh, private water systems, uh, very roughly, we estimate maybe 300 private water systems in the uh, Greater Big Sky area. There are essentially no water quality res uh, regulations for private water systems that serve 15 or less service connections. So nobody's going to come and tell you to do anything with your water. You're basically on your own to, to figure out uh, what you're going to do. Uh, the only regulations are basically in the planning process, where you're going to put your septic, and where is that located in relation to your uh, well. Uh, so as uh, Mike mentioned before, compared to the alluvial aquifers that uh, provide big sky water and sewer with water, uh, the surrounding aquifers are generally pretty poor in quality. Uh, typically, water quality problems that we have in the area include iron, manganese, sulfur, hydrogen sulfide, uh, low pH, hardness chloride, arsenic, uh, reducing bacteria, slime forming bacteria, coliform, fine sediments, radon, uranium, and radionuclides. Iron, probably have all seen something like this somewhere, but uh, extremely common in the Big Sky area. I would say about 90% uh, of the private uh, water systems I operate have uh, some considerable levels of iron. Here you see fairly con uh, considerable levels. Uh, iron's an aesthetic and a functional concern, you clog, but you're not really going to uh, uh, have any adverse health effects there. Um, here you see what uh, sulfur and hydrogen sulfide look like. It's basically that black filter on the left is what the white filter on the right looks like after uh, hydrogen sulfide. Um, you also get the rotten egg smell, which is fairly common. Again, not really a big uh, health concern, but can cause some gastrointestinal issues. Then we have acid water, uh, low pH, which is fairly common uh, in our area. Uh, 6.5 is not uncommon, down to below 6, which is extremely acidic. You can see what it does to water system components. Uh, iron, sulfur, slime 
forming bacteria, coat the inside of components. They basically feed on iron sulfur and produce hydrogen sulfide, which creates a rotten egg smell. So you know you have them. Here's your bigger problem. Invisible, tasteless, odorless contaminants, low pH, lead copper, SOCs, VOCs, nitrates, nitrites, coliform, E. coli, radon, uranium, radionuclides, and arsenic. You could have a nice clean glass of water from your tap and you would never know that you are consuming uh, potentially toxic water. Um, so this is what it looks like when you drink arsenic. Um, a bit. So this is a case study from last summer. That I'll basically just uh, describe briefly. I had a uh, somebody called me, come up, look at their well. They said, uh, you know, we just moved in here. We think everything's good. We've got this big filter system under the house. Water tastes great, but we're just kind of, you know, curious. I think everything's fine. Uh, I said, you know, I have some other clients in the area. We detected, you know, some low levels of arsenic and some other contaminants, which probably test the water a little bit. So uh, tested the water. I uh, ended up discovering it was about four times the EPA recommended limits of arsenic. And so, of course, they have a water treatment system that should deal with it. I start opening it up, find out it's basically large sand filters. They're meant to deal with particulates and uh, nothing to deal with the arsenic. The kind of sad tail end of the story is the lady or the family that lived in the house before the older lady passed away from uh, massive cancer several years before. And probably was consuming water like this for, you know, decades. The house has been there for quite some time. Maybe not the uh, sole factor, but certainly didn't help long-term health. Um, commonly used treatment systems in big sky uh, ozone. I use uh, quite a bit, uh, 80, 90 percent of systems. It's a great oxidizer, basically decomposes to oxygen, so it's very clean and uh, removes most of our contaminants, uh, acid neutralization to raise pH, aeration using atmospheric oxygen, which does not disinfect as ozone does. Uh, ultrafiltration, which is designed for fine sediments, and then reverse osmosis, which is unfortunately fairly overused, removes all the contaminants from the water, um, expensive, and wastes 70% of the water that you put into system. So to make 500 gallons of water, you basically consume 1,500 gallons of water, uh, creates highly acidic, aggressive water, leaches system components, unhealthy for long-term consumption. And I've ran into places where wells are completely depleted and they're not producing water anymore because they've been using whole house uh, RO systems, shouldn't ever be used for a whole house or commercial filtration systems. So uh, long-term recommendations based on this. Uh, and, and our Big Sky community uh, consider the effects of salt-based water softeners on the public water systems, private water systems, and the environment. Uh, consider the effects of whole house and commercial reverse osmosis systems on water supply and aquifers serving private and public water systems. And then the uh, greater Big Sky area, um, Mike and I have kind of discussed this. And, uh, you know, in that kind of case study, I basically started reaching out to adjacent homeowners that were clients of mine saying, hey, you know, you know we should test this short of going door to door through all of Spanish Peaks North, you know, uh, there's no way to really disseminate this information. So uh, some type of database where you could see at least localized uh, contaminants. Despite uh, local contaminants, you could be in a completely different aquifer than somebody uh, 500 feet away. So some type of program to facilitate awareness and water quality testing for existing newly constructed private water systems where people would be encouraged to um, you know, sample their water, know what's in their water, and uh, therefore then act accordingly in their best interest. And that's it.